LVC and happy Valentine's Day. For those of you who are watching who don't know me, my name is Jeremy and I serve as one of the pastors of Lavington Vineyard Church. A number of years ago when I was living in Washington DC, some friends visited from out of town. And so in addition to seeing all the different monuments and the famous sites like the Capitol building, we went up to see a huge cathedral in Northeast Washington DC. It's the largest cathedral in the Western Hemisphere, the largest church in the Western Hemisphere. It's called the Basilica of the Shrine of the Immaculate Conception. And it's a grand building, just absolutely gigantic. And as we walked around, I was definitely in awe most of the time, just looking at the, the grandeur of the place. In fact, I think it's one of the reasons why cathedrals are the way they are. And I, I love seeing cathedrals around the world because they do inspire this sense of awe and grandeur. Unlike a lot of the, the huge modern megachurches where you don't really get a sense of awe, you get a sense of entertainment. Kind of like a shopping mall of sorts with Jesus thrown in. Well, so cathedrals can give you that sense of awe, but I confess that as I walked around, and this particular cathedral in Washington, D.C. is quite gaudy. There's just a lot of gold and glitter. And I remember thinking just on one hand, does does God really care about this? Especially given all of the, the money that's been spent. Does God really care about all of this gold and grandeur? Well, I think whether it's a cathedral or a big modern church building or any normal simple church building, there's a way that we as believers in Jesus, his followers, can become fixated on a building in such a way that it pulls us away from what we should be fixated on as his followers. So we don't want to be pulled away from fixating on what should, we should be focusing on in this fallen world when there's so many macro issues going on, cosmic issues, if you will, going on all around us. In those times when we have all these things swirling around us, we need to be able to fixate on what he's calling us to do and how to respond to be part of what he's doing, doing in this fallen and broken world. Well, in today's passage in Luke's gospel, we're going to see this clearly. So as we continue in the series in the gospel of Luke, we come to this final part of the showdown. It's a trilogy of sorts. That as we come into the temple, there is a temple showdown. This is now the third part where the focus is really going to be on the disciples and a specific teaching that Jesus gives them. Now, if you're around LVC and paying attention to the second half of Luke's gospel, as they're on this journey from Jerusalem, excuse me, from Galilee down to Jerusalem, the focus is on the disciples and they are being formed by the master, by the rabbi. Well, in this third part of Luke that we're in, this final week of Jesus's life before his death and resurrection, the, the disciples fade a, just a little bit to where he and his passion is now front and center. And if you know from the last couple of weeks, the main focus has been these confrontations with the religious leaders, the teachers of the law and others. But actually today we're going to get this focus on a teaching he gives specifically to the disciples, most likely as others are still listening in right there in the temple. But in this temple showdown, it's now time for the disciples to get a teaching that they desperately need. Well, as we come to this difficult passage, we're going to see there are two extremes that people have often gone to in thinking about this text of Scripture. One is that it's completely about events of 70 AD. Because if you're not familiar with church history, in 70 AD, the Romans completely destroyed the temple, the great Herod's temple that had been built for the Jewish people. So it was destroyed by the Romans completely. And many people think that what Jesus is talking about here is all about that time, about 40 years later. Other people think, on the other extreme, think that it's all about the end, the end times. But I hope you'll see with me, and I want to try to persuade you, that it's not an either or. It's a both and. Now, so unlike last week, where we kind of jumped in and out of different passages, I'm going to read it all at one time. I want you to see the scope and the flow of this passage, and then we're going to drill down into it. And so 
Listen for that both and. So this is Luke chapter 21, starting with verse 5. Some of his disciples were remarking about how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and with gifts dedicated to God. But Jesus said, as for what you see here, the time will come when not one stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. Teacher, they asked, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they're about to take place? He replied, watch out that you are not deceived. For many will come in my name claiming I am he and the time is near. Do not follow them. When you hear of wars and uprisings, do not be frightened. These things must happen first, but the end will not come right away. Then he said to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, famines and pestilences in various places and fearful events and great signs from heaven. But before all this, they will seize you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and put you in prison. And you will be brought before kings and governors and all on account of my name. And so you will bear testimony to me. But make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you will defend yourselves. For I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents, brothers and sisters, relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. Everyone will hate you because of me, but not a hair of your head will perish. Stand firm and you will win life. When you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, you will know its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those in the city get out and let those in the country not enter the city. For this is the time of punishment and fulfillment of all that is written. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. There will be great distress in the land and wrath against this people. They will fall by the sword and will be taken as prisoners to all the nations. Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. There will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. On the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. People will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. When these things happen, begin to take place, excuse me, when these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. He told them this parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that the summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Be careful, or your hearts will be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life, and that day will close on you suddenly like a trap, for it will come on all those who live on the face of the whole earth. Be always on the watch. And pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. Each day Jesus was teaching at the temple and each evening he went out to spend the night on the hill called the Mount of Olives. And all the people came early in the morning to hear him at the temple. This is God's holy and inspired word. So here's how it flows. Here's how to get a grip on this passage, how to get a handle on it before we start drilling down into what does this mean for them listening? Now, what does it mean for us even 2,000 years later? So in verses 5 to 7, so if you're taking notes, I'm going to give you a bunch here to just get down. But for the rest of you, listen closely. 
Uh, maybe consider taking notes if you don't do that, but listen closely. And I hope this helps give you a handle on how to understand this text. So in verses 5 to 7, of course, Luke sets up the teaching. Now, if you remember from last week where we ended in chapter 21, verse 4, as part of the showdown, Jesus indicts the teachers of the law. He pronounces a judgment against them because of how they had devoured widows' houses, how they were hypocrites. Well, and then the very next thing he sees are rich people putting in a relatively big amount of money, whereas a poor widow, out of her poverty, gives her last two coins. And I argued last week that I think that text is really about judgment. Because for the fact that this poor widow would think she has to give these last two coins is a sign that this temple, this unjust religious system, is coming down. You see, because those teachers of the law, those religious leaders were supposed to be taking care of, their, of that widow. So, right after that scene ends, and Jesus comments on what he sees with the poor widow, the disciples look and say, look, look at this amazing temple. Look at, look at the beautiful stones. And he says, no, it's all coming down. So then in verses 8 to 11, he sets up the end. The end of all things. But in our modern day, we often refer to as the end times. But verse 9 makes clear that the end will come later. So then in verses 12 to 19, he starts off with, but before all this. So before the end comes, they, the ones listening to him, his disciples, they will go through personal trials. Verses 20 to 24, he talks about Jerusalem's desolation and he prophesies that it's coming and that harkens back to verse 6 these stones you see they're all going to be torn down well then in verses 25 to 28 he shifts back to talking about the end especially the son of man verse 27 he says at that time they will see the son of man coming in a cloud with power and great glory so at whatever time that is because not even he is the son knows exactly Only the Father knows. At that time, the people living will see the Son of Man. So that prophecy in Daniel chapter 7 of the the one who looked like a Son of Man coming on the clouds with great power and authority, that's going to happen one day, Jesus is saying. Well, then in 29 to 33, he gives this parable of the fig tree and talking about the kingdom of of God, looking for these signs of the kingdom. And then this generation... And you see, when he says generation here, it doesn't necessarily mean those living at this time. But even in his own words from other parts of the Gospels, where he says this wicked and perverse, or this unbelieving and perverse, adulterous generation, that's the sense of the word generation. Those who would oppose the kingdom of God. Those who would oppose the rule and reign of King Jesus. Well then, in verses 34 to 36, We see their call, the ones listening to him right now. It's their call to respond to all of this because they will stand one day. We will stand one day before that Son of Man who has all authority. Well, then he ends verses 37 and 38. Luke, our narrator, says that Jesus is teaching at the temple and all the people were coming to hear him. So it starts at the beginning, just talking about this temple and how grand it is. And it ends with the fact that people are coming to him and he continues to teach. Where? At the temple. Highlighting the fact and bringing it home that this whole system, this whole temple system is coming down. So there is a judgment coming on the temple. Now part of this is that it was God's intention that as the new covenant comes in, that his people would become the temple of the Holy Spirit. But see, in addition to God in his sovereignty with the new covenant, replacing the temple system, on top of that, the religious leaders had made this so corrupt, it had become an unjust system. And it's coming down. So all of this is going on in the text, and you may not still fully understand it, and it's one of the most tricky passages in all of the Bible. But this is what I want us to get, LVC, and anyone listening. This is what I want us to understand. Because for those listening to him, his beloved disciples, here's the key point. 
while all these macro issues are swirling around you in your day and age and what's coming in the future, he wants them to think about their micro lives. To not have a fixation with what's happening around them, but to have a fixation with what he is calling us to do as his followers. So there's two main ideas of how they are to respond, of what they are to fixate on. That's to watch and to stand firm. Watch and stand firm. Let me show you where we see this. So, under watch, watch out that you are not deceived. Verse 8. Be careful. It's another way of saying watch. Be careful or your hearts will be weighed down. Verse 34. Be always on the watch and pray. Verse 36. So that's watch. And then he says stand. Stand firm. Stand firm and you will win life. Verse 19. Stand up and lift up your heads. Verse 28. Make up your mind. I love this. Make up your mind not to worry beforehand. Verse 14. I love that, but it's really hard. That is a really challenging verse. Make up your mind not to worry beforehand. So I want to encourage you about your individual life and challenge us this morning. But let's first think about us as a church family, as a local church. What does this mean for us as a church? Well, number one, I think one of the implications of this text is to not have a fixation on a building. Now, in some ways, this is easy for us because we don't even own our own building. We rent a school and we're thankful to have that place that fits us pretty well. So it's not even for us like about this big cathedral or big, fancy, expensive modern church. But nevertheless, LVC, it is possible that even or especially during this COVID time that we could become fixated on going to a building. Now look, I'm going to say a bit more about COVID and our response to it. And I just want to say as I address this point that I get the fact that we want to gather. That we love to go and worship. And so even in times where it's not been with your home church, maybe you've already gone out and visited some churches that are gathering physically because you just miss singing or just hearing live preaching, seeing other believers. But I think when it comes to a building, there are a lot of Christians in the world today who fixate on that event of going to that one building. And all of their religious or spiritual life revolves around that location. But I think this is challenging us to say, we we cannot be fixated on a building, on a particular location. But now at the same time, I want to challenge us to not forget for however long this pandemic is going to go on, to not forget the importance of gathering together as a body. And so I think for for a number of folks, not just in our church, but around the world, got really comfortable with doing church, quote unquote, whatever the, the service looks like, of watching it in your pajamas. And there may be many, whether it's an LVC or elsewhere, who say, you know what? If my church doesn't record or live stream or do whatever it takes, even long after the pandemic, uh, I'm just going to find another church that's going to live stream so that I can watch church in my pajamas. I can make my own coffee or tea and sit there on my couch and just me and Jesus. Well, I think when the time comes, we're going to be actively teaching about why it is crucial why beyond this extraordinary circumstance of a pandemic, it is right and necessary and proper for us as the body of Christ to gather together. Well, let me take this time to to give an update on the COVID situation. And so I wanna take some time on behalf of the elders to share a bit of that update. And so I think it's worth taking a bit of time within this sermon. I think it fits well in the context but I hope it's helpful for you. So look, church, a good number have been asking, why aren't we meeting when kids have gone back to school? Many adults have returned to their offices. So a good number have been asking about that, and I bet most have at least been wondering about that. And look, I I get that. I get that. But at the same time, it doesn't mean an automatic decision 
for us to return to McKinney School to be doing in-person services. Our desire is to target Easter for regathering, but that is not 100%. And we think it is best to, to have that subject to the information that we have on the ground over the next, what, four to six weeks. And as a team, as an elder team, we're going to be making this decision with a lot of counsel and advice from others. Make a decision as the 4th of April approaches. So look, we would love to come together on that Easter Sunday to celebrate after a year. We were one of the first churches in Nairobi to stop services. By the way, we never shut down. We've always been open. But we were one of the first to stop Sunday services and we're one of the last um, to go back. But listen to, to what our internal experts are conveying. Because just a couple days ago, I had a very sobering and insightful conversation with some trusted respected experts in our, con- in our congregation. So one is that we cannot make decisions based on quote-unquote official testing and hospitalization numbers as they are simply too low to be a reliable, reliable barometer. So most people cannot afford a test. And when it comes to the hospital, most people cannot afford an ICU bed if they are gravely ill. Our perspective would be that If it were not for the UK and the South Africa variants that are wreaking havoc on the world, they are posing huge risks. And our perspective would be different if those were not around. But we need to be patient, church. We feel like we need to be patient as scientists and medical experts get a clearer picture. And church, indeed, our worst days may be ahead. Significant vaccinations are quite a ways off for Kenya. Healthcare sources have been saying in the past three weeks to brace for a second wave. And like I said, ICU beds are not filling because most people cannot afford them. And let me just challenge us individually because I, like you perhaps, I've gone out, I've, I've met with people one-on-one in a safe way. My kids have, have gone out and hung out with friends trying to be as safe as possible. We want life to return to normal. We know we can't be 100% safe. And when we, but when we go out, we feel like, I mean, is it really that bad? But can I challenge us to think that our individual perspective of what we see and experience in daily life is not the full scope and danger of COVID-19 in Kenya. And yes, we're in the extreme minority of churches that have yet to meet physically, but we feel it is best to take a cautious approach. And it's true, we can't be 100% safe and individuals are understandably desiring worship in person and people will make individual decisions based on their conscience before God. But as a leadership, our collective conscience as a team has meant a conservative approach. That's just where we stand. So although the government and most parents find it necessary for the kids to do in-person learning and many adults have found it safe to return to the office, although frankly, a lot of them are probably forced to go back. We believe the evidence shows that churches and their Sunday activities greatly increase the risk of transmission. To mitigate the effects of of pandemic fatigue and the loss and the sadness of not being together, we wanna start doing something more this year. And frankly, I I wish we had started doing it in September and October. And I, I, the buck, stops with me. So we, we plan to start having small live audiences for sermons, for live preachers to be able to preach to a live audience because preaching just to the camera, even though I love Robert here, our camera guy, we miss preaching to a live audience. So we also think that'll be a way for people to get together and see each other and we'll do it safely. Also, we want to gather those in a safe way who are just not able to connect as much virtually for whatever reason. And so we want to be able to gather those folks even once a month for some times of fellowship. And so look, if Easter service does happen, kindly know that it would be low numbers. It would still be recorded, especially for those who who can't come or you don't feel comfortable coming yet. Uh, We would have it recorded so people can watch it later. And we would also have really strict rules for attendance. 
So we, can, we continue to consider the possibility of a smaller gathering for Easter, but we're going to continue to assess the situation and make a final decision probably by mid-March. Because if we go forward with it, we would have a very strict registration process so that we could do contact tracing if necessary. So please, church, once again, if you are feeling disconnected at all, please do reach out. Reach out to the church office, office at lavingtonvineyard.org or connect at lavingtonvineyard.org. We want to know how we can come alongside you and assist you and be with you during this time. So let me just say at the end, let's be thinking of medical workers and how we can show love to them by making individual and collective choices to be as safe as we can. Because I'll just be honest, church. In times when I thought, you know what? I just don't think this is big of a deal. Or I just start to get lax in my own mind. And I hear a testimony of a medical worker and they are our soldiers on the front lines of this battle. And I hear them in tears often, lamenting the fact that they feel like they've been forgotten. They've been neglected. While people are just trying to go about their lives, many not caring, others just maybe not having the information and just assuming that, hey, everything's okay. And meanwhile, in countries around the world, they're the ones bearing the brunt. And so let's be thinking about them and what can we do to love them, even if we don't know any to love them by being as safe as we can. And look, the church has never been closed. We've never shut down. Ministry is happening. I hope through these sermons and just testimonies we've had that you've been hearing of how even during this pandemic when we've not been meeting as a whole church physically, that ministry is happening. Perhaps this all sounds so hard to you right now that even as you've taken in news about vaccinations and these variants, and you think about just the things swirling around in your own life with the economy, maybe the loss of a job or not being able to find a job. And you, 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 you hear these words from Jesus about standing firm and, and watching. Maybe that all just sounds so hard. Can I just draw your attention and have us fixate on verses 17 to 19? Jesus says these strong words. He says to these people listening to him in the temple, everyone will hate you because of me, but not a hair of your head will perish. Stand firm and you will win life. Now verse 18, what does he mean? Not a hair will perish? Like they're going to die physically eventually. How is their hair not going to perish? But I love how he's saying to them, I see your micro life in the midst of all these macro cosmic things. I see your micro life to such a fine detail that I know the hairs on your head and not a hair of your head will perish. It's like this one author says in light of all the teaching of the New Testament. It's like what Jesus is saying here to them is it is not death to die. It is not death to die to die. Not a hair of your head will ultimately perish. So he says, stand firm and you will win life. Win life? What does that mean? Is this a competition? Well, no, as he says in Matthew chapter 10, you will be hated by everyone because of me. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. You see, as all these things are swirling around and we go through the trials of life, one day when we stand before him in glory and he says, well done, my good and faithful servant. You see, when we look back and that perseverance, that endurance in the midst of hard times will be the evidence of the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the actual residence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Paul, near the end of his life, would say to this young man, Timothy, I have fought the good faith. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but to all, also to all who have longed for his appearing. Church, he said, his words are that the Son of Man is coming. 
So what does it look like for you? What does it look like for me to move from a fixation on the macro issues in our lives to now fixing our eyes on Jesus? As the author of Hebrews says, fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Look, when lovers begin their relationship, they love to hold the hand of their lover. Maybe eventually put a ring on it. The hand is important, but what becomes most important, especially as the years go by, and maybe those lovers grow old together, they learn to look at the face. Because when you look at the face, you see in the eyes. You can, it's like you're seeing through the eyes into the heart. And the ability to trust is not based on the hand, but it's based on what you see in the face and how that reflects the heart. Trust is seen on the face. It's seen in the eyes. There's this quote that's attributed to Charles Spurgeon that I love, where it says, God is too good to be unkind, and he is too wise to be mistaken. And when we cannot trace his hand, we must trust his heart. When we cannot trace his hand, we must trust his heart. My sister or brother in Christ, are you looking around at life going, God, what are you doing? I can't see your hand. And maybe he's calling out to you this morning saying, I know. Will you wait and will you trust me and will you trust my heart even when you cannot see my hand? Let's pray. Lord, I want to pray right now, especially for those who are going through something that's even way beyond the normal, way beyond what we're all going through with this pandemic, but those who are almost, feels like they're at their wit's end. God, I pray that they would have the ability to look back and say along with Paul that our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal weight of glory that far outweighs them all. Or for those where these troubles do not feel light, they feel heavy. They don't feel momentary, they feel eternal. They feel like they'll never get out of this pit. Lord, I pray that you would give them the faith to believe or enable them to reach out and to look into your face, as it were, and see your heart, to trust your heart. And Lord, for all of us who are just going through varying degrees of pandemic fatigue, or even for those in our church body who have tested positive this week, God, may we all individually as families, as households, may we be vigilant in fighting against this virus and doing our best to be as safe as we possibly can. God, we pray for those awaiting tests, awaiting results. God, we ask you for the vaccines to come soon. But Lord, in the meantime, help us to be the church, to be the family of God for each other. Oh, we need you. So we ask this in the strong and powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Love you, church. God bless you.